So what I wanted to talk today was cervical spine deformity, some pearls and pitfalls. But always before I give this talk, I always want to start with the alignment perspective. Uh, when we're in a uh, joint uh, course with uh, orthopedic uh, residents and fellows, as well as neurosurgery residents and fellows, I always want to talk about the alignment perspective of the cervical spine. That seems to be these days with the increase in uh, cervical spine surgery to be an issue. And, and the reason is there isn't very, there isn't very good uh, normative data about the radiographic, the HRQRLs associated with uh, spinal deformity and also an understanding of the global effect of what we do in the cervical spine. Now, pathologies always affect alignment, um, which increases disability. Uh, including things in the severe form as in breathing, swallowing, and also radicalopathy. So when we talk about cervical spine, I'm always interested in also the uh, global spine and the compensatory mechanisms used in the rest of the regions of the spine. So the questions that I wanted to ask was, are there fully established cervical deformity classifications and treatment options? And are there defined indications for surgery to correct cervical malalignment? And are there set standards to address the amount of corrections uh, needed? So when you look at a comprehensive summary of cervical deformity, I wanted to talk about the alignment parameters, as I mentioned, the related outcome measures, and also practical optimal alignment, and also complication management, which I'll barely touch on. But as you know, the cervical spine is responsible uh, for keeping the head over the body and also to help level your horizontal gaze. And uh, it controls part of the uh, center of mass um, in relation to the rest of the body. In biomechanical stability issues, uh, initially we, we thought of it as a two column, the anterior column and two articulating facets in the posterior column. And we also compared that to the thoracolumbar three column uh, measurement, but it really becomes a two column uh, uh, construct when you look at it from a biomechanical perspective. And it's responsible for uh, load sharing and distribution. 36% uh, is related, 36% uh, of uh, load sharing is via the anterior columns versus 64% in the posterior columns. In this contrast, the thoracolumbar uh, spine, which also describes and uh, also. Uh, which indicates its stability uh, also. So why a lordotic cervical spine? Mostly to compensate for the thoracic kyphosis, which is needed for expansion of, during lung volume changes. And also this increases with age. So you're gonna have more cervical hyperlordosis with age um, versus in the degenerative nature, a loss of that lordosis, which increases pain and disability. So how do we measure this lordosis? We, the three methods that are typically used are the Cobb method or the Jackson um, tangential lines uh, or the Harrison tangential lines. And typically uh, the Cobb method tends to underestimate lordosis and this tends to be more tedious, the uh, Harrison's line. So I typically like the Jackson line to measure between the posterior uh, vertebral body of C2 with a line bisecting the posterior vertebral body of C7. And you can tell here that the normal segmental cervical angles in the asymptomatic adult is most of your cervical lordosis uh, angulation lies around C12 and C67. So it's a cumulative total from C1 to 7, but it's very well distributed at C12. Uh, uh, the preponderance of your, uh, your lordosis or ability to um, flex your neck. How about translation? That becomes a bigger issue based on our atrogenic uh, cost uh, deformity. Um, we do know that an increase in the uh, C2 uh, sagittal vertebral axis um, increase, uh, e equals a poor HRQL. And this is one of my concerns is converting a uh, well-balanced spine to an atrogenically induced cervical kyphosis. And what, that's, what matters and why does this uh, matter, I should say? It's because it increases the energy expended to keep that head, as I mentioned, balanced over the body. 
So it, 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 as you progressively lose your translation, you end up having to carry a higher load or the energy expended is equivalent to carrying a higher load. And sooner or later, the patient fails to compensate. And this, uh, the repercussions uh, equals the uh, added degeneration, pain, and, and a poor chain reaction. We're now realizing uh, that uh, there are some measurements that uh, correlate or are associated with cervical lordosis, such as a patient, in, in order to gauge whether the patient has adequate lordosis, there is a correlation of the uh, T1 slope with the cervical lordosis, i.e. a small T1 slope um, requires a lesser cervical lordosis to maintain balance. And this sort of helps in planning surgical deformity cases. Because we, uh, as, as you know, postoperative cervical kyphosis increases in the, uh, increases your uh, spinal deformity and it decreases your uh, HRQLs if you follow them long enough. Now, what about the spinal cord that's in the, uh, uh, in the whole uh, center, center of the system? New studies uh, have shown that there is increased myelopathy and stretch associated with cervical kyphosis, associated with cervical deformity. And if anything, it's post-surgical kyphosis um, mm -hmm. does increase the uh, myelopathy. And there are new studies about how that can be corrected and brought to the fore. And it's, um, as we can tell, in patients who have a pre-existing thoracolumbar deformity, there is a high uh, prevalence in um, cervical kyphosis and cervical uh, 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 positive sagittal malalignment. So how do we go from, uh, or how do we avoid pitfalls, uh, such as putting a cervical plate and then deciding to wire the patient as opposed to doing a better and stronger and stiffer construct. And really, um, I, I thought wiring was, was done until I recently admitted a, a patient uh, about a couple of months ago or so who had wiring uh, in, in their neck for one reason or the other without actual uh, segmental instrumentation. And really it's a, a throwback from old techniques that still exist. And then you have an issue where you do have uh, piecemeal surgery with a patient is presenting with a lot of neck pain. Um, Post-surgery, uh, we, we've done uh, myelograms, the nerves are all free. And so we then decide we, we want to put in these uh, uh, stimulators, which really, after the, uh, which really doesn't help the patient's cause at all. It really, it's an alignment issue. It's, it's uh, poor surgery and poor surgical technique. So we really need to get the patient well aligned and uh, it, it helps uh, yeah, HRQLs and also their quality of life. So some of the culprits of iatrogenic failures include uh, things such as metastatic disease, infection and trauma. Uh, surgery for a focal metastatic disease could then lead to a poor maintenance of alignment if not uh, stabilized. And, and also bone quality assessment. I mentioned all these as uh, thanks to remember when uh, it's sort of a total collapse of a multi-level ACDF in somebody who has very poor bone quality and uh, it just adds to uh, bigger and um, more uh, tax and surgery. <clears throat> now, this is immediately post up. You can see the staples, uh, but guess what? We, if, if the patient's initial bone quality is not addressed, it then leads to more pseudoarthrosis, loss of alignment. And if we have to then correct this, even after uh, augmentation of, of the uh, bone quality, it leads to a bigger and more, uh, uh, a, a, a more tax in surgery. So <clears throat> I just wanted to mention that things to know in this day and age uh, evolved that these surgeries are not without uh, high risk, okay? There's, high neurological injury, more surgery, more scar tissue. Uh, we worry about uh, they uh, losing the ability to uh, maintain the anterior uh, functions requ requiring tracheostomy or a peg tube. 
and of, of course, vascular injury and also soft tissue injury, as well as uh, difficulty with healing leading to infections. And of course, we never get into the point of uh, getting appropriate alignment. So I'm happy that all of you are here. I'm happy that we have an online uh, audience. And a lot of these things that I'm mentioning will be repeated uh, throughout the course. And to, for you to recognize that the easiest thing for you to do is to use navigation or use robotic technology put in the screws. The alignment really matters uh, to prevent uh, deformity or uh, should I say, uh, create deformity. Um, that you have to always have these principles in mind when doing it. So then I have a situation where uh, there are some very, very rare, particularly in the posterior cervical spine, um, where you, you want to avoid place, placing uh, any hard work. And I put this slide in uh, because there, there has been a very, very few, and I mentioned this carefully, very few instant instances where I would like to do a decompression alone. And, and this involves a high recognition of the patient's pre-existing alignment, a one facet uh, destruction rule um, because of the two column, um, uh, two column theory of, of cervical spine and really, they have to have a preponderance of, a, uh, of uh, significant muscle um, layers. If you have somebody with a trophic muscle and you're doing a decompression without augmentation, uh, they are going to fail. So you, you do have uh, to have a great, greater than four layers of muscle closure. And you have to really be conversant of your, where your C2 and C7 spinous process attachments to prevent um, adjacent uh, level and also transitional level failures. Uh, just want to remind you of these two columns uh, theory that I have. So again, a frail patient is not the one to do the decompression alone. You have to be good enough to expeditiously put in hard work. Um, and also patients with poor bone quality, neoplastic disease are the worst to do short construct on because you need more points of fixation to anchor uh, they are alignment well. So things that you have to be aware of is a patient's physiological age and not just their age presenting, their bone density. Uh, if you're doing any surgery that involves a patient with rigid deformity, I think two surgeons in this day and age is a must. Um, there are certain things that need to be achieved during this procedure that needs to be done in a rather rapid uh, scenario. Now, I put in obesity, I, I just say, look, if they, if they cannot help themselves in that regard, you, you cannot take on the burden and the risk of, uh, of worsened bleeding and literally functional outcomes. Anytime I see a paper that says obesity doesn't matter um, with spine surgery, I always chuckle because it's either from a huge database where they haven't really uh, had a granular look of things or uh, there's also another alternative, uh, ulterior motive. It does, and it doesn't need an anecdotal answer for that. But really it's overall general health. Pre-op assessment, including nutritional status is a must. Um, in order for us to uh, prevent issues where we're added to a hyperkyphotic or hypolodotic spine, which then generates a chain reaction to overall global alignment. And I just wanted to conclude uh, by saying that it's all about the amount of compensation needed uh, uh, by the patient to maintain their uh, alignment and literally their global alignment. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Kojo. Um, it's always uh, great to hear your talk on cervical deformity. Um, any questions for Dr. Hamilton? Go ahead. Parameters at all in consideration of extending your fusion up to C2 or not? Charlie, I didn't hear the question. Can, can, can you question can was, sum it up for me? Do you incorporate C2 tilt uh, into the, the evaluation preoperatively with regard to whether you go up to C2? I typically end up going to C2. Um, not necessarily because of the tilt, but for the anchor. It always seems 
like C3, it's either C2 or C4 for me, never C3. And, and there's been uh, significant uh, papers about issues with uh, C3 leading to adjacent level issues at C2. And C2 gives me a more powerful anchor for cervical alignment. But uh, yes, but I do consider segmental um, measurements, but in the practicality, it ends up being either, do you need to go to C4 for me or C2 uh, in terms of um, uh, what the patient uh, needs. Dr. Hart. Hey, Kojo. Great to hey. See you. <laughs> Great to see you. I wish you were here live with us in the Northwest, but it's for a homecoming. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody has to take call. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really, you. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I wanted to ask, and I apologize because I didn't see it every minute of your, spoke, of your talk, but um, how has, has kind of this awareness altered your approach to simple couple level ACDF uh, surgeries or has it? And I think a lot of these deformities as in the lumbar spine start with, uh, start with that first surgery. And uh, how are you approaching that differently with the knowledge you have uh, maybe over the next last few years? And that's, a great, that's a great question. The anterior surgery at, at one or two levels um, as you can see from the amount of uh, degree per segment in the cervical spine, in the subaxial spine, uh, I think at the level, if I'm having to do a three level uh, that I, I'm not going to back it up. Uh, and, and I rarely do even at three levels. It's only at four levels that I really consider. Uh, attention is placed a lot as to the graph that I'm, I'm placing in. So I'm still, very particular uh, about using uh, uh, allografts that are hyperlobotic in, in doing my ACDS. Um, and just because it also allows me to contour the spine anteriorly. And I always get a plate bender to make sure that I align the spine appropriately. Um, and of course, before we all started, I try to get the optimal um, alignment with, with also positioning even sometimes in a chin strap or a, a shoulder roll. The issue has to do with, there, there's less of an issue with one or two level anterior surgery. It's when we, dis, we start doing one or two level posterior, three level, four level posterior spine surgery where we sort of kick the patient into cervical kyphosis. That's when I begin to worry, but nevertheless, I've become very, very aware of um, of alignment uh, um, with regard to uh, with regard to uh, changes in my practice. Great. Right. Okay. Go go ahead. One more question. So, Kojo, did you hear that? No. Can you sum it up for me, Charlie? Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. What, when do you decide to use an anterior cervical plate versus just a standalone cage with integrated fixation? Ah, that's a good question. I don't have an exact um, science for this, but anytime I have to do more than one level uh, anterior cervical, uh, anterior cervical uh uh, surgery. I, I prefer to use a plate mostly for rigidity um, and on, also to prevent any, to prevent a lot of the shear forces. So one level, yes, standalone, um, uh, but anytime I have to go two levels, I, I prefer a plate. Yeah, I also, uh, you know, the standalone cages were originally designed as zero P, zero profile devices to be used adjacent to existing uh, plates. Uh, but what I've found is that there's a relatively high incidence of pseudoarthrosis in that situation because you have something very rigid at the bottom and something not so uh, solid at the top or at the bottom. And so I've resorted to uh, just taking off the old plate and putting on a new plate um, in my practice. All right, so uh, thanks very much, Kojo. I appreciate it.